Hey, thank you for joining us today at Calvary Baptist Church Online. I'm Gary Wimberly. I'm the lead pastor here at Calvary, and we are delighted that you chose to join us today. Here at Calvary, we are a, a group of people that are made up from all walks of life that are helping each other and people in our community to find and to follow Jesus. And as you join us for our message today, our desire, our hope is, is that you, wherever you are on your journey, that we can either help you find Jesus and Him be your Savior, or you can help follow Jesus and your journey with Him. So watch the message today. I hope it's a blessing. And please stay tuned after the message. I have a short uh, message I want to give to you when we're done today. Thank you. Hey, thank you for joining us today for Calvary Baptist Church Online from beautiful Lancaster, Pennsylvania. If you have your Bibles, get them out and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 11 today. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. And while you're turning, uh, let me remind you of an upcoming event, Christmas Eve service here at Calvary. Uh, it'll be from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. And uh, we want you to join us. It'll be a time for the family. Uh, it'll be Christmas carols, the Christmas story. And uh, we'll close out the evening under candlelight, sing a silent night. Just a good family time for everyone to come together and remember the Lord Jesus. And uh, we keep it right from 5 to 6. So plan to come out and be with us. If you can't be with us in person, uh, we're going to do our best to record it and present it to you uh, when you are available to watch it. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11 today. And we're in our third message in a series called Christmas Unwrapped or Unwrapping Christmas. And uh, we have been looking through what does Christmas really mean. And uh, as we unwrap it together, uh, we found out that the first gift that we unwrapped a couple of weeks ago was that Jesus can simplify your life by taking your complicated, complex, and condemning life situations and uh, from us because he understands us. Isaiah 53 tells us that he knows exactly what I go through and he's willing to allow us to roll all them onto him. Last week, we unwrapped the second gift, which was that we have received the greatest news ever. And that is Jesus, the Savior, has come and he's come to deal with our greatest need, which is to be saved from our sins. And today, we can offer this same gift of forgiveness that we receive from Jesus. We can give that gift of forgiveness to others. And so today, we're going to look at the third uh, gift, unwrapping our third gift. And, uh, and really, it's an interesting thing when you think about gifts and Christmas morning. Uh, you can remember probably uh, when you would uh, have Christmas morning with your kids and uh, you would save that one particular gift. Uh, maybe you would hide it. Uh, maybe you put it back somewhere where they couldn't see it or hide it under the tree in the back uh, where they didn't uh, know what it was. Or maybe they thought it was for a relative that you haven't nailed it yet. But it's that one gift that uh, the child, your kid, asked for the most. They begged you for it. They told you they couldn't live without it. That if you get this gift for them, they'll never want anything else ever again. And then they unwrapped all the gifts that you got them, and it wasn't there. And they were disappointed. And uh, they really didn't know what to think. It was a big letdown. That all of a sudden, uh, you may be pointing out, what's that under the tree? Or, hey, what is that over there? And, uh, and you brought it out. You gave it to them. And uh, you remember that look on their face? Their, their, their eyes got as big as saucers. Their faces begin to glow uh, with excitement. And, uh, and when they finally unwrapped it, there just were no words to express the feeling of gratitude and thankfulness of that gift that they just received. And, uh, and they just held it all day. They played with it all day or they uh, worked with it all day. And it was just, it, just an unbelievable sense of them treasuring that gift uh, because they wanted it so badly. That brings us to what our third Christmas gift today is when we go to unwrap Christmas, here's what it simply means. It means treasuring the gift of Jesus in my life and in my church community. And uh, when you think about that, really what Christmas is, is treasuring the gift of Jesus in my life 
and in my church community. And so today, we, we're going to combine uh, this third gift and the Lord's Supper or communion together today. And I hope to, to bring together what does Christmas and the Lord's Supper have in common. And here's what they really have in common. They both, Christmas and the Lord's Supper, both center around Jesus and our worship of Him. You know, worship is really an interesting thing uh, when you think about it. Today in churches all across our country and all across the world, there's this thing called worship wars. And uh, what we mean by worship wars, we mean there's an argument and there's uh, tension and there's frustration over what worship is in church today. And, and most of that uh, fighting and struggle is with uh, a style of music or with instrumentation that's being used or how it's presented. But what really is worship? And uh, what does the word worship mean? In a, in a non-church setting, in a, in a non-religious setting, what does worship, to worship something really mean? And to worship something means that I treasure it or I value it above all else. It receives all my attention and really whatever I worship, it influences all my decisions. So for instance, if you worship your car, uh, you treasure that car more than anything else. And you value it more than anything else. And you make your decisions about your car based upon how much you worship it. In other words, do you cover it with a cover? Do you put it in the garage? Or do you wash it, wax it every weekend? And, and you treasure it. Uh, you value it more than anything else. And we worship so many things in our life. We can worship our jobs. We can worship our kids. Uh, we can worship money. Uh, we can worship uh, our retirements. And uh, there's so many things that we can worship, we treasure, we value above all else. But when you take the word worship uh, and you put it into a biblical context or you put it into the church setting or, or into Christianity, we find that true biblical worship is my voluntary response to the revealed greatness of God. In other words, as I see God as he really is, as I understand God as he really is, and it's revealed to me, then I respond to him. And I re respond to, he, to who he is. And really, when you think about the practice of worship, there's both an inner and an external uh, influence or practice of worship. Number one, the inner experience of worship is my treasuring. Uh, like, like that gift I talked about earlier. It's my treasuring the true beauty and worth of God. That's the inner worship. I treasure it. I value it. Like that child valued that gift that you gave them at the very end of Christmas morning. And they treasure it. They, they hold on to it. They don't want to let it go. And they're, they're just ooing and aahing over it. That's the inner part of worship that I see and I treasure the true beauty, the true worth of God. And that inner worship really transforms into an external worship. And our external worship is really where the, the confusion comes. And really external forms of worship are the acts of how I show how much I treasure the beauty and worth of God. And that's in many forms in many ways. Uh, you can sing uh, as an outward act of treasuring or worshiping God. Uh, you can raise your hand in service or you can say an amen or you can sit in silence. Or maybe some of you cry uh, when you worship. These are all external uh, forms of showing how much you value, how much you treasure the revealed greatness of God. The true accurate picture of of God in your life. And here's the third thing you need to understand about worship is that all worship of his true biblical worship, it must engage truth and emotions. It must engage the truth and it must engage emotions. I remember reading what John Piper said. John Piper said, when feelings of God for dead are dead, when our feelings 
for God are dead, then our worship is dead. And so we need to understand that true worship is in truth, John chapter 4, but also in spirit. And if you look up John 4, you see that that word spirit in John chapter 4 verses 16 through 23 is a little s. Meaning that's the emotional side of us. Uh, that is the, the part that responds with emotion. And so, uh, and that could be different for everyone. And so we need to understand that it's full of truth and it's full of the spirit. And when you read through the scriptures, you find that God created all of life to be a form of worship. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31, he says, Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God, to worship God. Now here's the implication as, as we lay the foundation for the message. The implication is that when we come together as a church, the spirit or the demeanor of our gathering together should be one of focusing on the Lord. And uh, it shouldn't be what we're about to read in chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians. It shouldn't be just a careless act. It shouldn't be just something that we gather together. It's not a country club. And it's not a, a, a time we just come and just haphazardly have no reason or no purpose. No, coming together, worshiping together, is to be one that is focused on the Lord. And so look, if you would, in your Bibles, you can follow along as I read. And we're going to unpack and, un, and, and, and see what happened in this church that Paul had to address and shows us what true worship or treasuring Jesus really is when it comes to the Lord's Supper. So let's begin in verse 17. He says, but in the following instructions, do I not commend you? But when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part. For there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, and another gets drunk. What? Do you not have... Uh, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I condemn you in this? No, I will not. Or stop there just for a moment. What was going on was, is the church was gathering together. And what was happening is they were bringing food and meals to the church and they were eating, being gluttonous in their eating. And they were drinking wine to the excess of becoming drunk. And when others that were not so uh, wealthy and, and were struggling financially and didn't have a lot, they were holding, the rich were holding the food to themselves, eating it before anyone else came. So when the poor come, no one was there. There was none left for anybody else to come. And Paul is saying, look, don't you have, the time of coming together as a church is not uh, to eat and get fat and get married and drink and get drunk. He says, you have houses uh, to do that kind of gathering. When you come together in the church of God, it's different. It's not about us. It's not about my need. It's not about me uh, coming, coming to church to be all about me and what I want. No, when we come together as the body of Christ, it's about the Lord. So look at, as we continue in verse 23, look at what he said. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks uh, the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. So let a person examine himself. Then so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. 
For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. And that is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. And so Paul goes on to instruct them about what is true treasuring of Jesus. What is the true value of of the Lord's table. And so today we're going to learn that as we look at the Lord's Supper, as we look at this time of communion together, when the church comes together as a congregation, congregational life of the church, it should be for a purpose. It should be for a reason. Now, I know with COVID, uh, things have been very different. Many of you have been unable to join us uh, because of maybe a predetermined condition or maybe a struggle or you just don't feel safe and 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 the church is scattered more than ever in in our history that we understand but the truth being told is that when we do come together when we come when maybe when we get back together again we need to understand that coming together as a church is different it's not a time just to enjoy the meal it's just not a time to have a fellowship we can do all those things at home or at a restaurant or someone else to meet our physical need. See, when we come together as the body of Christ, this is for the intent to meet our spiritual need. This is to, meant to, to worship as a body, as a church, to worship and treasure the Lord above all else. You see, in this season today... We look back at Christmas as a time to treasure the baby Jesus. In Galatians 4 and verse 4, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son made of a woman. That's Christmas. And, and we come together, we, we set these decorations up, and we do all these lights, and we, we treasure the baby Jesus. But truly today, that's only one half of our worship. The other half is that we need to treasure not only His birth, but we also should look, should look at treasuring Christ as our Savior through the death on the cross. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8, And being found in fashion as a man, He humbled Himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And so what does Christmas and what does communion have in common. And here's what they have in common. It is a time for both of us, both to treasure Christ at Christmas and to treasure Him now doing the Lord's Supper or in communion. So let me look at, I want us to look back at these, these verses. And there's three words that I see that Paul used to help us and encourage us of how we can treasure Jesus now at Christmas and also treasure Him in communion or in the Lord's Supper today. So number one, if you want to follow along in the outline, number one, we treasure Christ at Christmas by remembering His death. By remembering His death. Look back at verse 24. He says, And when He, he had given thanks, He broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Look at verse 25. In the same way. Uh, also, he took the cup after, uh, after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Paul uses this word remembrance. Let me ask you a question. When you think about remembering, uh, don't we put up trees in our homes and don't we have certain ornaments that we put on those trees? Maybe it's a picture of your little one when he was born or the first Christmas or maybe it was an ornament that grandma made for you. And we put those on the tree or we put these pictures up in our homes. Why? Because we want to remember. We want to remember the, the special memories that Christmas meant to us. What Paul is saying to you is this and is saying to me is that the Lord's Supper, communion, is a time to remember. A time to remember. It's a set-aside time to remember. What are we remembering? Here's number one. 
Christmas is when we treasure, when we remember that God's Son was born on earth. Christmas is when we treasure that God's Son was born on earth. Isn't it crazy today how that Christmas starts at the end of October? When you go to, uh, when you go to Walmart or you, you go to uh, all these stores, they start setting up Christmas and the decorations and putting the lights out. Hobby Lobby, I mean, good grief, Hobby Lobby starts Christmas in July. And, uh, but the truth is, why? Because we treasure one time a year, we really focus and treasure our thoughts, our time, our efforts on remembering that Jesus was born on earth. But secondly, the same is true for the Lord's Supper. When we partake of the Lord's Supper together, we are treasuring the greatest sacrifice ever given for our forgiveness and our renewed relationship with God. That's why we take the Lord's Supper. It helps us to remember that we need to treasure not only Jesus' birth, but we need to treasure his death for our sins, for our forgiveness, for our reconciliation. In other words, bringing us back into right relationship with God. It reminds me of a passage in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse numbers 9 and 10. It says, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels. There's Christmas. There's his birth. He was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. There it is. Verse 10. For it became him from whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to, make, uh, to be made the captain of their salvation, perfect through sufferings. So the writer of Hebrews says, we remember him because he was made, he was born a little lower than the angels. And we remember him because by the grace of God, he died for every man. You see, worship, if there is going to be true worship, from our heart, from an authentic heart, then we must remember Jesus because he is the most valuable person in the universe. He is to be our highest treasure above all else. We remember his death because it is the most important death that has ever taken place in history. Can I ask you a question as you're watching uh, today? Let me ask you, has there ever been a time in your life, has there ever been a moment in your life where you saw your own sinful condition and you understood that you had a need that was greater than yourself, that you had a need so big, you needed forgiveness so much that you couldn't do it for yourself, you couldn't offer it for yourself, you couldn't fix it yourself. If you can't remember a time like that, then I want to say to you today that then you probably never put your trust in and faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and to the, the receiving of his eternal life. And today, when we take the Lord's Supper, what we're saying is, I remember that death, and I know what that death has meant for me. It means true forgiveness of my sin. And today, before you even take the Lord's Supper, I want you to know that today, that the gospel of Jesus Christ, his death, his burial and his resurrection is for you. And you today can experience the forgiveness of Jesus. You today can have a brand new life. The Bible says if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. And that is for you today. And I'm here today as a preacher of the gospel to help you to remember that Jesus died for your sin. And today you can receive that forgiveness that he has come to give to all mankind. And we can treasure Jesus today as our Savior. Number two, not only uh, can we treasure him by remembering his death, but the second word that Paul uses is found in verse 26. For as oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So number two, we treasure Christ at Christmas by proclaiming his death. Not only do we need reminded of why Jesus came, but also we need to show or proclaim or announce publicly that Jesus 
has died. Go over, if you would, in Luke chapter 2, uh, what we commonly call the, the Christmas story. Uh, in Luke chapter 2, and also found in, in Matthew as well. But in Luke chapter 2, in verses 9 through uh, 15, listen to what uh, the angels declared to the shepherds. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were filled with great fear. And the Bible says, For unto you, or verse 10, and the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy. That will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign for you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying or proclaiming. Glory to God in the highest and on earth Peace among those with whom he is pleased. You see, even back at the birth of Christ, there was a proclaiming of who Jesus is and why he came. And the true, the, the same is true for us today. Paul says, just like Jesus was announced at his birth, when we receive the Lord's Supper, we are proclaiming, we are showing, we are announcing to the world publicly how Jesus, how much Jesus is worth to us. The true treasure of his death. What it means for us. You see, if you really value something that is relevant and is truly precious to you, then what is going to happen is it moves you to delight in it or in that person. See, when we treasure something, we just don't hold it to ourselves, but we talk about it. It's like I told you at the beginning of the message. Remember when that child got that present that it wanted so badly? What does it do? It tells its friends, look what I got. You won't believe it. Or, uh, today they text. See it with a, with a picture on Instagram. See what I got. Look what, look what my parents got me. And what are they doing? They're proclaiming. They're letting it be made known what they treasure, the gift that they Received. By the way, we do the same thing. We, we proclaim things that we treasure all the time. For instance, I thought about wearing my Florida State hoodie today because I'm a Florida <laughs> State fan. And I, when I wear a hoodie with my favorite team, I'm proclaiming what I treasure. Now, they've done terrible this season. Uh, not watched them much, but hey, that's okay. Uh, we'll just move on past that. And we can't go to the Eagles as well because they stunk it up this year too. But people walk around with these sweatshirts or they walk around with, uh, maybe with a car that they, they drive a Ford or a Chevy or a Dodge. And what are they doing? They are proclaiming what they treasure. Do you know for us, many times, the only time that we proclaim what we treasure is one day a week. When we come to church on Sunday and we, we show up and we sit in the pew, we sit in our chair and uh, we hear the sermon and we may drop some nickels into the, the offering plate and, and we think that we're valuing Jesus by that. And we, talk, we don't talk about him any other day of the week. We don't share him with others any other day of the week. We don't talk about the gospel any other day of the week. And the truth is, is that if that's you, then I want you to know today, you really don't value Jesus. You really don't treasure Jesus. Because if you really did treasure Jesus, it would just not impact how you live on Sunday and what you do on Sunday, but it would impact what you do on Monday and Tuesday and the rest of the week and every day. See, if you don't proclaim him at any other time in your life, then does really Jesus value your worship on Sunday? If you don't value him during the week, if you don't treasure him with an outward expression of worship to him during the week by proclaiming him to others, then really is he really impressed by your singing on Sunday? I would say that would not be the case. See, we don't treasure Christ like we should if we're not proclaiming him to others. Paul said here in 1 Corinthians 11, when we remember the Lord's Supper, it does two things. Number one, remembering the Lord's Supper enables me to proclaim the gospel. That's what he says in, in verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death 
until he comes. When I remember to receive uh, the, the, the Lord's Supper, the, the communion of the Lord, then I'm proclaiming the gospel. But number two, at the same time, when I proclaim the gospel to others, I'm remembering the Lord's death. So they, they, they go hand in hand. See, not everyone remembers at the same time and with the same intensity. And so what we do when we come together to receive communion, we're all coming together at one time to say, yes, I remember. And yes, I want to proclaim to everyone that I have received the gospel. You know, when we leave here on Sunday and we go out into our workplaces or with our friends, you know, we get forgetful and, and life gets busy. And, and sometimes we fail to proclaim the, the true treasure of Jesus. But when we come together to do the Lord's table, all at one time, all at one place, we're saying, yes, I remember. And yes, I am proclaiming. And that's what we need to do. And that's what we're going to do today is we're going to proclaim that we remember the death, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And number three, not only uh, do we treasure Christ at Christmas by remembering his death, not only do we treasure Christ at Christmas by proclaiming his death, but thirdly, the third word that I see that Paul uses is that we treasure Christ at Christmas by being nurtured or nourished by his life. Being nourished. By his life. Turn back one chapter in your Bible to chapter 10 and verse 16. He talks about this cup and the blood again. And look at what he says in verse 16. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? That we, the, uh, the bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Now, when I talk about being nourished by his life, is Jesus Christ and his life truly enough for you? Is it enough? Is it satisfying? Does it fulfill all that you need? Notice on the outline, participating in the Lord's Supper is saying that I am completely nourished and satisfied with Jesus in my life. Think about that for a moment. I am completely nourished and completely satisfied with Jesus. Remember the problem this church was having? They were, they were bringing all this food to church and having a big party, a big fellowship, getting drunk and, and, and being gluttonous. And Paul says, no, 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 you don't do that here. You do that at home. You, you do that when it's not time to corporately worship together. What I want you to recognize is the, the little cup of juice, it's not much. And the, the little wafer, it's not much. But what they represent is invaluable because Jesus is enough to satisfy your life. Right. You only need Jesus to live a satisfied life. And that's what he says back in chapter 10. And in verse 16, when we receive the, the cup and when we break the bread, we are participating. We are taking in. And Paul says, is it not enough? Is it not enough? This sharing with one another, this fellowship with one another, this intimate time of worship with one another is letting everyone know together that we believe Jesus is enough. Do you know, number two, nothing shows the worth and my treasuring of Christ in my life as when we come together to feed our hungry souls on Him. Nothing shows the worth of Jesus, my treasuring of Jesus in my life more than when I come to feed on Him. And really, we do this every Sunday. We do it every time we open God's word. We're saying to him, I treasure you. I need you. Now, if you're like me, I get up somewhere between 5 and 5.15 every day. And uh, two things I do, I typically grab a bottle of water and I start the coffee. 
because I need coffee. And that's a strong word need there, but I need coffee. It nourishes me. Now, uh, remember, I don't, I don't drink coffee for the caffeine. I drink because I just love it. I treasure coffee. Matter of fact, I treasure Dunkin' Donuts coffee. And uh, when we were in New Jersey, uh, I became so familiar with our local Dunkin' Donuts that I would walk in the store, obviously before COVID, walk in the store, they'd see me coming in, have my cup of coffee ready, and hand it to me. That's how much I treasured it. I was there often. And the truth of the matter is, is that when we open God's Word every day, when we come to church on Sundays, here's what we're saying. Jesus, I need you. You is, you is what satisfies me. You is who nourishes my life. Today, in just a moment, we're going to take the, the cup with the cracker in it. And we're going to take the cup with a little bit of juice in it. And you say, hey, this isn't much. What is this going to do? It's not about the amount. It's not about how much it is. It's not about going uh, to one of these Amish buffets and, and, and gording ourselves. That's not what is satisfying here. What Paul is showing to us is that Jesus coming as a baby, living 33 years, dying on the cross, that his life, his life is where we find true spiritual nourishment and satisfaction. His life is what? sustains us. Let me give you one more passage before we close today. In Colossians, Paul wrote this church in Colossae. And he wanted them to know that Christ was enough. That Christ was satisfying. And in Colossians chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, here's what he said. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Paul said it. Christ who is your life. See, Jesus is our life. It's not about food and drink. It's not about fellowships. It's not about parties. It's about Christ. Christ is satisfying in my life. Now you say, Pastor, what, what's my next steps here? What, what do I need to do to treasure Jesus more than anything in my life? What do I need to do to truly practice worshiping Him, responding to His greatness in my life? Well, number one, you need to pray that Jesus teaches you or teaches me to understand and practice worship. What is worship really about? Is it about a style? Is it about a genre of music? Is it about a way we dress? All those things are external, superficial it's not, that's not what worship is. Worship is my voluntary response to the revealed greatness of God. And it looks different for everyone. I remember my mentor, Dr. Keene, saying, listen, I won't make fun of you when I worship and I cry. And when you worship, you raise your hands. See, everybody does it different. And uh, we get so hung up on a style of music and we get so hung up on a, a way to dress and we get so hung up on, on how long a service is or what we're doing up here or what we're not doing up here. And we get so caught up on the externals that we miss what true worship is. Grace and truth. Spirit and truth. See, worship starts inward way before it ever gets external. And what you and I need more than anything in this day and time is for Jesus to teach us, to free us, to worship him in spirit and in truth. Number two, my next step is I need to treasure Christ. I need to treasure Christ. Treasuring Christ is a participating activity. Meaning this, if I'm going to treasure Christ, I just don't hold it to myself. I just don't sit in my seat and I, and I keep it to myself. No, treasuring Christ is participating. I have an outward activity connected with it. There's something I do to show that I treasure him. Like I wear the sweatshirt with my favorite team. Like I wear the, the hat with my, my, my favorite car manufacturer. Is something I do to show outwardly that I treasure him. And we do that through the Lord's Supper. We do that by proclaiming him to others. That reveals how much I treasure him. And then third step. 
We need to find our satisfaction and our nourishment in the gospel of Jesus. Is Jesus enough? Are you looking for Jesus, not what he can do for you? Listen, we don't believe in Christian karma. Meaning if I do enough good, then God's got to do enough good back to me. No, no. We come to Jesus because he's satisfying. We come to Jesus because he's enough. And my question to you is this. Is Jesus enough in your life? Is Jesus the one satisfying in your life today? Maybe you don't know Jesus as your Savior. Maybe you're still trying to fill that emptiness, that, that longing of satisfying by the, the things that are out there, money and jobs and maybe addictions and uh, maybe a relationship, maybe a spouse or a child or, or maybe a, your retirement. And you're trying to fill all that, that those, those insecurities and those lack of satisfaction in your life. You're trying to fill it with everything else. And the only thing that can fill that in your life is Jesus. He's the one. That is satisfying. How can I treasure him? By remembering. It's just not about a manger. But it's also about his death. You can proclaim him as the baby Jesus. But also proclaim him. As your suffering savior. For the forgiveness of your sins. And your eternal life. Paul said in First Corinthians, uh, in Philippians chapter 1. For me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. My life is Jesus. Is he yours today? In just a moment, I'm going to pray and I'm going to give you an opportunity to grab your cracker and grab your juice. And I know this is a little different uh, than maybe what we're used to doing. But if you can't join us in person, then I want you to experience the Lord's table right where you're at in your living room today. And so I'm going to pray. And after I pray, uh, I'll give you a moment to go grab uh, your juice and grab your cracker. And we'll experience together receiving the Lord's table today. Father, thank you so much for not only coming in the manger, but also for dying on the cross. And Lord, you are to be our highest treasure. You're to be the thing that we worship more than anything else. You are the one that is to impact our decisions more than anything else. You have the highest value in our lives. And Lord, you proved that by dying on the cross. And in just a moment... We're going to take your cup and take uh, the cracker that represents your broken body. And Lord, we believe that, uh, that these don't literally become your body. These don't literally become your blood. But the representations of what you did for us when you came in that manger. You came to die for our sin. You became sin for us so that we can become righteous in you. And so, Lord, help us to remember, help us to proclaim, and help us to finish today being completely satisfied with you. In Jesus' name. Now, if you got your cup and you got your wafer this morning, your cracker, and uh, I'm going to read the passages. And I'd like for you to just to, to participate with me this morning. And uh, I, I hate that you can't be here and do this together with us. Uh, but I know if you, with an authentic heart, do this right where you're at, I know it would be an encouragement and a blessing to you as we remember and proclaim and see the satisfaction that Jesus is for us. So Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11 that when he had given thanks, he broke the bread and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we take the cracker this morning and we take it and we remember that this is Jesus' body that he gave on the cross that was bruised and beaten for our transgression, for our iniquity. And when he died on the cross, he was crushed under the judgment of God that we were deserving of. And he took that for you and he took that for me. So take your cracker this morning. And let's give thanks together for the broken body of Jesus. Lord, thank you so much for your body. For your sinless body that was given for our iniquity, for our sin. The chastisement of our peace was upon you. And God poured out all the wrath that we were deserving onto you. And you took it for us. And we remember that. And we thank you for what you did for us. With giving your body on the cross that we deserved. Taking the death 
that we were supposed to die so that we can have the life that you lived. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. The next verse says, in the same way, after uh, he took the cup and after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we take the juice and we say, Lord, this represents your blood for the cleansing and washing of my sin so that I can be reconciled. I can be put into a right relationship with you. So take your cup. Let's pray and thank him for it. And then we'll take it today. Lord, thank you for the, the blood of Jesus that washes my sin away. That blood that needed to be given so that we could uh, have our sins just not uh, covered, but to be removed in exchange given your brand new sinless life. And Lord, we thank you that even though sometimes we forget who we are, and sometimes we still choose to sin over choosing to do righteous, it doesn't change the fact that the blood of Jesus makes me righteous in right standing with God. And we remember and we proclaim and we thank you for shedding your blood for us on the cross today. In Jesus' name, amen. You can partake. And Paul said, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. And that's what we just did together. We proclaimed his death. This time of year, we're proclaiming his birth. And yet, we're going to treasure him today by proclaiming his death. Thank you so much. Hope you have a great day today. God bless you. Hey, I hope the message was a blessing to you today. And uh, wherever you are on your journey, if we can help you, please contact us here at Calvary Baptist Church. Go to cbclancaster.com, uh, and our information is there. You can call the church. You can email us, and uh, myself or one of our pastors will be glad to reach out to you and to be an encouragement and a blessing to you in any way we can. Another thing I just want to encourage you about, that you would like this and that you would share this with others in our community, maybe your friends, your family. Uh, we just want to be an encouragement to everybody we can. And maybe there's some, some in your circle of influence that uh, don't attend church, don't have a church home, and uh, you don't even know where they are on their journey. Uh, we would love to be a help to them if we can. So like us, follow us, and share us either on Facebook or YouTube, and that would be such a blessing. And also, uh, if this was an impact in your life, this was helpful to you, uh, we're wanting to broaden our online ministry, and you can help us with that. And if you'd like to give uh, to help us uh, get this message out further, to be a blessing to others, uh, contact our office. Uh, we would love to see this go around the world and help and encourage everyone we can to find Jesus and to follow Jesus. Hey, God bless you. Have a great day. Thanks for joining us.